We're going to be in John 10, 11 today, and also Psalm 23. And I'm going to bring those two together, hopefully, in a way that makes sense to all of you. Well, as I've said before, uh, I've grown up in South Dakota, was where I originally was born, in eastern South Dakota. But uh, one of the things I learned about western South Dakota is there's a lot of sheep, and I've mentioned this before. How many of you have ever spent much time around sheep? Anyone? few of you, yeah? Okay, we got a couple of, of people. Um, when I was in Mitchell, South Dakota, I was at one of our sister churches called Northridge Baptist, and we had a family there, um, for whatever reason, in eastern South Dakota, had a fairly large flock of sheep, and that's uncommon for eastern South Dakota. It's mostly just western, but these folks had sheep, and, and uh, they, they were a really neat family, and each spring it was really fun, because they'd bring in those little lambs to our Awana program, right? And, and those, you know, the littlest kids in our, in our Wednesday evening program would, would get to hold, you know, these just adorable little lambs. And they're so cute, unless they're like pooing everywhere, which they do. <laughs> That's the side hazard of bringing a sheep into a church. They're not house trained. But, uh, so, so these little kids would be, you know, hold these cute little sheep. But the thing is, they don't always stay cute, right? They don't always stay small and they don't always stay that, right? They, they don't always have that little uh, cuteness to them. Uh, they grow. And, and, and so uh, we were blessed, of course, to have this hardworking farm family and to, to share these with us. But uh, uh, they, they would grow up. And, and one of the things I didn't really quite understand at that time, so, so this family was a very well-respected farming family, and, and uh, their having sheep didn't really speak to their social status. But for us to understand as we look at sheep in the Bible, we have to understand... Uh, uh, what that means to have been a shepherd, you know. So as I said, our farm family was actually a very well-respected, successful farm family in our community. But when we read about sheep in the Bible, and we read about shepherds in particular, well, we read about an animal and some people who weren't always kind of at the top of the, of the social, specking, pe- uh, social pecking order. Um, when we read about the good shepherd, Jesus says, and we're talking about, in the sermon series right now, Jesus has some I am statements in the Bible. One of the I am's he says is, I am the good shepherd. Now, we don't think about that because we're not enculturated like that. But when he says, I am the good shepherd, people would have been like, say what? Because shepherds weren't really well thought of in the time of Jesus. Calling himself a good shepherd, in fact, would have been an oxymoron, right? Like jumbo shrimp, uh, things like that, where, where those two words don't shouldn't be together. A, a good uh, shepherd, people would have heard Jesus say this and it just like, what, what are you saying? That doesn't make sense, right? Because most people really thought at the time, and, and there was reasons for them to think this, that most shepherds were not good, right? These, these were men, primarily younger men, who on their own, if, if you've never been a younger man, I have. I have some experience. We're all kind of knuckleheads till at least age 25 at some degree, right? And so you got these younger men living out in the wilderness all by themselves. And, and they're nomadic young men. Um, and, and, and it was frequent that they would graze their sheep on land that wasn't theirs. You know, if they could get away with using your pastures, they'd do it. And they do things like that. They were notorious for, for lying, for cheating, for stealing. Um, They were Jews, but they were as low as it gets, socially speaking. Part of the reasons for that was they didn't observe kosher food laws. They didn't didn't have an opportunity to practice the ritual cleansings that you needed in order to go to the temple. And they certainly didn't go to attend the Jewish synagogue, going to temple, as they were supposed to every week. Because, first of all, they weren't clean. Second of all, they weren't trying to get clean. So third of all, they weren't eligible, right? Right? I mean, if you think about it, back in those days, one of the popular hit songs probably would have been like, Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be shepherds. <laughs> right? A couple of Willie Nelson fans out there. I'm not Willie. I'm not pulling out trigger, don't worry. But uh, have Jesus identify himself, right, as a shepherd, uh, it was quite remarkable for this time. But it goes along quite well, in fact, with his willingness to befriend the outcast, to to go and actually touch the leper. Nobody did that, right? Jesus was the guy who went and ate with tax collectors and with sinners. It speaks of Jesus' humility to become one of us in order that he might redeem us from our own sinful nature and give us the grace to become more like him 
when he speaks of himself in these terms. And so as I said, today we're going to be looking at John 10, 11, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And what does a good shepherd do? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So he is a good shepherd. God is a good shepherd. Now the gospel, the word gospel itself means good news. And it's good news for us that Jesus, the good shepherd, was willing to lay down his life, to die in our place. And if you come next Sunday, we'll get more in depth on that very subject. And the fact here that he says that I am the good shepherd, it implies certainly that there are others who are not good, right? And in fact, he doesn't just imply it, but in in John 10, 1, he, he says this, he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who's sneaking over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must be a thief and a robber. Now in that passage, he's talking about our spiritual enemy. See, spiritually speaking, we we have an enemy, and his name is Satan. He's the prince of darkness. We talked about this a little bit last week. And and he hates God, and he hates God's people. And his mission is to to steal, it's to kill, it's to destroy, right? He wants to ruin the things that matter to God. And and there are a lot of people in this world who are sick. There's a lot of of families that that are falling apart, a lot of marriages in trouble, a lot of kids who make bad decisions. And I believe at the very, very root of all of those things is this thief and this robber who tries to sneak into our lives. And in fact, Jesus said it very clearly. He said that is the mission of our spiritual enemy, Satan. And in John 10.10, he says, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, as we've heard. But Jesus says, you know what my purpose is? What's my purpose? My purpose is to give them what? To give them a rich and satisfying life, he says. Let's be super clear. Jesus is the good shepherd. So if Jesus is the good shepherd, who are we then in the metaphor? We're the sheep, right? We're the sheep. And despite that fact, despite the fact that we are the sheep, God loves us anyhow and shows us His grace and His mercy anyhow. So again, Jesus the Good Shepherd. We are the sheep. Now if you don't know, and most of you probably don't, if you don't know, sheep for the record, this animal is mentioned more times than any other animal throughout all of Scripture. It's the most commonly mentioned animal. 200 different times, over 200 in fact, you will find sheep mentioned in the Bible. And we are the sheep. Unfortunately. We are the sheep. That's not great news, folks, right? You know why? Because sheep are some of the stupidest animals on the planet. Right? Think about it. Have you ever been to a circus? Right? You'll see elephants. Elephants are a pretty smart animal, actually. You can train an elephant to do all sorts of things. Uh, We went and saw Dumbo just the other day. Interesting movie. Now, you can train an elephant, right? You can train a horse. You can train a dog. You ever seen a flea circus? I guess maybe you can train a flea. I don't know. I've never seen a flea circus. But it's hard to train a sheep. In fact, you really can't hardly train a sheep at all. You could try to, you know, you, you, you could try to teach a, a sheep to play dead, but the only way to make them play dead is to shoot them, and that only works one time. <laughs> right? And it's like game over. But they're not smart animals. And so, I just need to say, with all the love of Jesus, you're stupid and so am I. Yes, folks, that's how you know your pastor really loves you, right? He calls himself and you stupid on Sunday, huh? There you go, right? But the truth of the matter is, if we're honest, sometimes we are a little bit thick-skulled, aren't we? We are sometimes a little dumb. We are often like sheep. And let me give you a few of the challenges of being a sheep. The first one, if you're taking notes, is this. Sheep, sheep get lost very easily. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, there's a verse that uh, talks about this in Isaiah 53. It says, all like sheep, all of us, all like sheep, have gone astray, and each of us has turned to our own way. You see, it's incredibly common for sheep to walk away from the shepherd's fold. You know, I mean, if, if you're a sheep, you're kind of like, 
hmm, what's that over there? I think I'm going to go try and nibble on some of this. And, oh, what's that over there? I'm going to eat some of that. Oh, that looks delicious over there. And pretty soon you're like, Bob, Sally, Bill, where did everybody go? Right? And the poor sheep is lost. He doesn't know. He just saw something delicious and off he wandered. Thinking, nah, that over there is going to make me happy. I'll go try that. That, oh no, well, that didn't make me happy, so I'm going to go try this. Maybe this will make me happy. I'm going to go try that, right? Do we do that in life? We do. And what we're really trying to, to, to find out and to figure out in life uh, is something that could make us happy, but along the way we make a series of, of bad decisions. And all of a sudden we're lost. And it's because sheep without a shepherd get lost very easily. Note number two if you're taking notes. You should know this about sheep. Sheep are very stubborn. Stubborn animal. Somebody look to the person right next to you and go, I think he's talking about you. <laughs> yeah? I was saying if anybody would do it. You can say, hey, you're incredibly stubborn. Right? Sheep are stubborn. And, and some of us, we're not going to admit that because you're too stubborn to admit it. <laughs> but I've read about sheep and I've, I've met some sheep. And sheep are stubborn and, and, and they're not smart. And when they do things and they get themselves into a dilemma, they get themselves stuck, they don't have the reasoning skills nor the intelligence nor the willingness to get themselves up. It, it's not uncommon to have a sheep get stuck in something that if it was smart enough, if it wasn't so stubborn to keep trying to push through, it could back itself out of the problem, but it won't. It keeps pushing into the problem. They just keep lodging themselves worse and worse, keep trying to go forward more and more, even when that's the problem. How many of you know somebody who's like that? Yeah? When the problem starts to increase, they just keep pressing into that problem. They keep going worse and worse and worse instead of backing their way out. Now, if that person's here, don't point at them today. Just think about them. Number three, if you're taking notes, sheep are filthy. Seriously. Lambs, they're cute. They smell nice. They're fluffy. Sheep, on the other hand, disgusting. If you ever seen a sheep on TV and it looked white and fluffy, that's because they probably had to take a power washer to it before they showed that thing on TV because that wool gets nasty. Okay? They're filthy. They stink. It, it, it's, spend some time around adult sheep and you'll understand what I'm talking about. They, they, they have a funk that just won't go away. And if I can say it a little respectfully, that's the way all of us are in the eyes of God. Filthy, kind of nasty. We don't smell the best, right? Now some people might say, oh, well, he's a good guy. Oh, she's a, she's a good girl, right, right, right? Well, in the eyes of God, we are very, very dirty, filthy sinners. Falling way short of God's standard of perfection, each and every one of us. And so the bottom line is, sheep need a shepherd, and we need a savior. We need Jesus, and without him, we, we are completely vulnerable to the lies of Satan. And that's why it's really, really good news for us when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I will lay my life down for my sheep. Now, what I want to do with the rest of our time together is, is I want to show you four incredible qualities of the Good Shepherd. And I pray that, that God would help you connect these things to your heart and that you'll find ways to apply them to the way that you live your life every day moving forward. And the very first one, if you're taking notes, and if you're following along, you can jump to Psalm 23. That's where we're going to be for a bit. The first one there is, the good shepherd guides. In Psalm 23, David says, the Lord is my shepherd, right? You, many of you have this memorized, you know this, you're already planning on using it at your funeral, right? The Lord is my shepherd. Then in verse 3, he says, he guides me along right paths for his name's sake. The Lord guides us. He is there for us. You ever find yourself 
facing a, a big decision. He didn't know what to do. When you seek the Lord, He will reveal Himself to you. He will help guide you in that decision. John 10, 3 and 4 says this, The gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherds, and the sheep recognize His voice, and they come to Him. Jesus, the good shepherd, He calls His own by name, and He leads them out. And then after He's gathered His flock, He, he walks ahead all of them. And what do they do? The Bible says, and they follow him. Why? Because they know their shepherd's voice. Sheep may not be smart, but they learn what their shepherd sounds like. And you can, if, if back in the time of Jesus, you could mix flocks together, and you could put one shepherd on one side, and another shepherd on the other side, and they begin to call their flocks, and the sheep could sort themselves. Pretty cool. See, the sheep know his voice. And this is powerful. The sheep recognize the voice of the good shepherd. Now some of you might say, well, I don't know all the voice of God, right? You're expecting it to sound like, I don't know, Morgan Freeman or James Earl Jones or something, right? When I think of God's voice, it sounds like one of those two guys. But we can hear from God. Now, I'm not saying we all are going to audibly hear from God, the voice of God speaking to us. I, I guess that's still possible, but most of us probably aren't going to hear from God. The, the primary way that we hear from God is, is we hear from God as we spend time in God's Word, as, as we're reading the Word of God, as we're studying. Well, we can hear from God, too, when, when we're doing things like when we're praying, right? When we, when we connect and commune and spend time with God. We can hear God through our circumstances. We can hear God through other faithful Christians as well. We can hear God through a, a prophetic message. God can speak to us in, in a number of different ways. And, and the sheep who belong to Him, they, they know His voice. And they know it's Him who's speaking to them. And the good news is our, our good shepherd, if you're one of His sheep, He calls you by name. And this is one of the, 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 the most beautiful pictures in, in all of Scripture. To know that our God is a personal God and a relational God who wants to be in relationship with you. All of us. Each and every one of us. And He calls you by name. Uh, you know, I mean, when, when, when somebody calls me right on the phone, and more and more I find phone calls an annoyance in life, right? Because most of them aren't ones I want to take. But when somebody calls me, I know right away whether or not they're a telemarketer, Right? Because my last name, my last name is My Rose. But if you read it, it's M-E-I, so it's German. And nobody can say that right, right? So I pick up the phone, I answer the phone mistakenly, and it's a telemarketer. Most of the time they're going to say, well, Mr. Melrose? There's no L in my last name, sorry. Right? Or I'll get Mr. Mayrose, Mr. Melrose. Mr. Morose, I get that one occasionally. Morose? Come on. <laughs> but you see, our Father in Heaven, He knows our name as His children. We have a God who is that personal. He tells us He knows the hairs that are numbered on our head. And He wants to reveal Himself to you. And He calls you by name. The second thing that the Good Shepherd does is He provides. Our God is a God who provides. In fact, Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2 and 3, David says this. He says, The Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. I love that imagery, right? He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now many of you haven't spent a whole lot of time, but how many of you have ever seen a sheep lying down? Any of you? Okay, most of you know. Most of us haven't seen sheep, let alone see them lying down. I, I understand that. But if you were to spend some time out in western South Dakota, western North Dakota, eastern Wyoming and Montana, there's more sheep than you could ever count out there. And uh, it's not all that frequent you'll see sheep lying down. Because there's, there's a number of criteria that need to be met before a sheep is willing to lie down. The very first one is they will not lay down until they are well fed. 
Second, they got to be getting along with the other sheep that they're hanging out with. If, if they're in conflict, and sheep have conflict. That sounds kind of weird to say out loud, but they don't always get along with one another. And so if they're in conflict, they won't lay down because they don't want to be vulnerable, right? And they have to feel safe in order to lay down and take a rest. But in the presence of the Good Shepherd, the one who leads them to the green pastures, they are full. They've been in His presence. He's broken up all of the fights. He helps them get along. And it's a Good Shepherd's very job to keep them safe. So the Good Shepherd takes care of us, folks. And then it goes on to say, He leads me beside quiet waters, right? Why quiet waters? Because if there's, you know, raging water, a torrent of water, a rushing of water, the sheep will not go down into it and drink. Why? Because if a sheep falls into that water, they become like a giant cotton ball going down the stream. But here's the deal. Have you ever washed a wool sweater? How much did it weigh when you pulled it out of the washing machine? Right? That, 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 that fairly light garment comes out of the washing machine weighing about 45 pounds. Now imagine your entire body is coated with about three, four, five, six inches of wool sweater. How much would you weigh? And how well could you swim? There's a reason sheep don't want to venture out into rushing water. Right? Well, the good shepherd, though, he leads them to the, to the right kind of water so that they can drink. And what is the right kind of water, folks? Jesus is the living water. And once we drink of him, he tells us we will never thirst again. He quenches that, that inward thirst so that we can be at rest. And then the Bible says, and he refreshes my soul. I love this. He's such a good provider, right? He doesn't just provide for us materially. He doesn't just provide for our bodies, but He provides for our souls. And some of you, right now, on the outside, it looks like you got everything you need, right? But on the inside, your soul is lacking. Maybe you're in a spiritual desert. There's something that's just your soul is not at rest. And you might be a sheep without a shepherd. Because our Good Shepherd is so loving in His provision that He can then refresh our soul. Inwardly, we can be at peace. So if you don't have that, seek Jesus. And the amazing thing is, when you are a sheep under the care of a Good Shepherd, all sorts of things in your life can be falling apart, right? But you can still have a supernatural peace that won't make sense to anybody on the outside. You can have a peace, a joy that will surpass understanding, that transcends anybody's ability to understand. And that is because the Good Shepherd is there refreshing your soul, despite what might be happening in, happening in your life. Your soul is at rest on the inside because you know the Good Shepherd. And the Good Shepherd guides and the Good Shepherd provides. Now the third thing, if you're taking notes, is He also corrects. Now, this might not be the greatest of news if you're a sheep that's been out wandering, right? It may not at least seem like good news at the time, but truly it is good news. Because the Shepherd loves you, loves you, the sheep, all of us. He loves us enough to correct us when we go wandering particularly when we wander into danger. Job 5, 17 and 18. Listen to the riches of this. Job, man who knew this well, he said, Blessed is the one whom God corrects. Now, I understand, like when you're being corrected, many of us remember this from our childhood, right? When our parents are disciplining us, in that moment of being disciplined, it doesn't feel very loving. Right? Right? But our parents do know. They're trying to help us learn something so we don't have to learn a more painful lesson somewhere down the road. That's called wisdom. But when you're being corrected, you're like, I'm blessed, really? But really, if God didn't love you, if He didn't care about you, He'd just let you do whatever He wanted. But true love is actually correcting. So do not despise the, the discipline of God Almighty. 
Now, I'll be honest, not anybody's probably sitting around going, oh God, I think God's disciplining me. All right, this is going to be good. Give me some more. Let me have it, right? Nobody does that. I know better than that. But here's what Scripture does say about it. Hebrews 12, 11. It says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it produces a harvest of righteousness, of peace, for those who have been trained by it. See, our Good Shepherd God is so loving that He loves us even enough to correct us, to keep us from further harm. Final point if you're taking notes is our Good Shepherd protects us. This is what the Bible says in Psalm 23, 4-6. David says this. You'll know this. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because the Good Shepherd is with me. For you are with me, David says. When God is with us, what do we have to fear? When He is with me, I am at rest in my soul. When He is with me, I know that He's working in all things to bring about the good of those who love Him and who have been called according to His purposes, right? David says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, my good shepherd. Then he goes on and he says, your rod, right? He talks about the rod. What is the rod? The rod was a weapon that, or a tool that the, the, the shepherds would carry that would help them you know, corral and control the sheep, but it would also be a tool to protect the animals in case a wolf or something was trying to come. They could use that to scare off or, or to beat away or to, to, to injure whatever animal might be coming to try to harm and threaten their sheep. And David says, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So that staff had that, that hook at the end. You could use that to reach. A, maybe a, a sheep had fallen down into a crevice and you couldn't reach him. That would extend your reach. You could use it to reach out and, and, and rub the sheep. Kind of like a, a massager, sheep massager, right? And you rub it across their backs. and That way you didn't have to touch their filth with your hands. So there's an advantage to having a shepherd's crook. And Psalm 23, 6 says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me. They'll overtake me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, God protects me. Now, this doesn't mean we'll never fall upon physical harm. It doesn't mean that in spiritual terms that, that, that he's, he's going to make sure that we're always protected. No, the challenges in life will come. But our God in heaven has stored up for us an inheritance that will never perish or fade. And the Good Shepherd is the one, as we are told, who would lay his life down for us. In fact, Jesus told the parable, right, of the, of the sheep. He said, if a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, because we are prone to wander, right? Good old song tells us, reminds us of that. We're prone to wander. And what does the shepherd do? He leaves the 99 to pursue that one. Maybe I just need to say today that maybe that's the whole message for you today. Maybe you've been that one. Maybe you've been wandering, thinking something over here is going to make you happy, something over there is going to be happy. No. And eventually you find that you're lost. Maybe you're the one the message is for today. You need to hear from God today. You need to know that you are the sheep. But He is the Good Shepherd. And He is coming for you. God is always looking for us, seeking us. He doesn't hide from us. He doesn't run from us. Not even in the midst of our deepest and darkest of sins. He is still there. Scripture is clear that Jesus is our Good Shepherd. And all of us, Without Jesus, we are sheep who have gone astray. And whatever may come this week, wherever you may go this week, go knowing that Christ is with you if you are with Him. He calls you by name. Hear His voice. Go forth this week with the confidence that God loves you and He will and has laid His life down for you. 
He is the good shepherd. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you give us this amazing example of the depths of your love. That God, you would lay your life down for us. That you would do whatever it takes to reach us. That God, you seek us. You don't run from us. That Lord, even in our times of our most sinfulness, when we have gone astray, when we've followed worldly pursuits, when we've tried to solve our own problems, when we've only made things worse and dug the hole deeper. Even in the midst of that, God, you look down upon us with grace, with mercy, with your love. So God, we are humbled and amazed by that and we rejoice in it, are thankful for it. And God, in this very moment, maybe we've been just wandering and we need to turn back to you. Maybe we've been thirsting, seeking the wrong things that don't fulfill the need. Lord, may we turn to you. May we hear your voice as our good shepherd. May you guide us home. May we know your comfort, your protection, or your provision, as well as your correction, Lord. And as we do that, may we grow in our love for you. God, we thank you for every day that we draw breath. It is a good and glorious gift from you, and we rejoice and are glad in it, and we want to make much of you in that. And God, if there's somebody here today who just have us not ever before taking that first step of faith. We pray right now, God, that they would just boldly step out and say, God, I hear these words and, and I want you to be my good shepherd. And in this moment, God, I, I just pray that I turn my life over to you. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, that I've been lost, but now I can be found. Found in you for all of eternity. So God, if that is the case, uh, we pray that you would come into our lives and we would turn away from our sin and we'd put our hope and trust in you for eternal salvation. And God, if that is the case today, we rejoice. And for all the rest of us, Lord, we every day need to turn away from our sin. We are still all sinners in need of a Savior. None of us is perfect. All of us are broken. And God, all of us, we turn away from our sin and turn to you in love and say, thank you, God, for showing us the way, for being our shepherd. Lord, we love you. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you need some prayer today, we'll have a prayer team here at the front of the church in just a moment. Come up and have some prayer. If you're done with that, or if you don't need some prayer and you'd like to go ahead and join us in a little minute, we're going to have donuts in the upper room. Go on up and grab one of those. You can even take it for the road if you've got to get somewhere. But thank you for being here. Go forth. Be blessed this week. Go and serve your King. Amen.